worldwide fans of the planet, Hannah's Entertainment with an edge. I'm Jaime in Fuego, so stoked to be once again welcoming you to my namesake program, Ad Fuego Tainment. That is right, y'all. Another kind of Fresca Fuego review. That's because I was originally going to see this the same weekend the Child's Play came out. And then I was gonna see it the same week that Annabelle uh, Comes Home came out. And yeah, so I got my fair share of other kinds of dolls uh, of the scarific variety for the horror show, the other bigger YouTube channel that I do work with. But it was finally time to get around to Toy Story 4. That's right, Disney Pixar at it once again after Boy, like, it's around a decade-ish, maybe? Maybe a little bit less. I'm trying to remember, honestly, offhand. But it's been many, many years since we got Toy Story 3, which presumably, according to everybody, rounded out a trilogy and was going to be all she wrote. It really, it ended very just kind of put a bow on top and let this be the end of it. I mean, Andy all grown up going to college, a uh, new girl named Bonnie taking on the toys and stuff. And so it all just seemed like... Uh, you know, there was closure and everything was okay, but uh, lo and behold, we get another entry, which approaching, I was pretty positive, cash grab, cash grab, cash grab, and I approached it with that sort of mentality, very just minor expectations. I love all three of the original movies, but the first one being my favorite. I mean, the second one where they add, uh, you know, uh, Joan Cusack and stuff, I, I mean, eh. Okay, okay, my least favorite of the series, and then the third one was honestly, like, genuinely terrifying if you're a child, especially, I would imagine, that incinerator scene at the end. Just, man, it stuck with me. But, so here on Fuego Tainment, I always like to cover Bueno, Malo, and Feo, just like boom, 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 you see below. And so, the Bueno is the fact that I think this is my favorite Toy Story since the first one. And as much as I enjoyed three, I can't believe I'm saying that, but... Uh, I, I felt a little bit more of a sense of closure with what they decided to do script-wise with this, especially, especially with one character in particular that I don't necessarily know if I'm going to spoil in the Feo, in the Ugly, at, at the very end, but yeah, I guess I probably will. So just to brace yourselves in the third portion here is when I, I will give forewarning, obviously, before I segue into it, but... This is a story I didn't necessarily think needed to be told, but it is almost like an epilogue of sorts, and after just watching Spider-Man Far From Home, which was essentially an, another Disney property epilogue to Endgame, which was so big and huge and, you know, just, I don't know, so emotionally draining and kind of scary at least, this kind of had a similar effect, uh, where I can really compare the two and the fact that Toy Story 4 is really fun once it finally starts going, and initially, my expectations seemed to be proven correct. I was like, okay, joining the kids there with Bonnie. She's getting ready to go to her first day of kindergarten. And yet you immediately see that uh, of all toys, Woody is the one who has been seemingly passed over. You know, all the rest practically, uh, you know, with the exception of some of her older toys that are stuck in the closet. Um, you know, everyone else seems to be doing just fine, but Woody, um, he's playing second fiddle, he's being left in the closet, you know, he gets his first dust devil thing and the other much older toys are making fun of him and asking what he's going to call it and everything. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it starts out okay enough, you know, but it's really once we get to the main story of who becomes the villain in this, where it was legit like no other Toy Story movie that's been known before. Like, wholeheartedly. And, you know, Forky, everyone's making this big deal about Forky, and he's fun, and he has a very interesting perspective, not being a toy, per se, just being a toy that Bonnie creates on her first day with, like, you know, uh, pipe cleaners and a spork and, you know, like, some of those weird glue, you know, gonzo eyes that spin around and stuff. So, um... <clears throat> He has this very amusing perspective that induces quite a few laughs where, you know, he's like, I'm trash, I'm trash. And uh, I just kept thinking of this, this buddy of mine I used to work with who was like, trash, you're just such trash and stuff. And man, I, it just made me laugh anytime he was like, I feel so much just more at home, you know, trash is warm, sometimes sticky and, you know, but it's, it's so welcoming and, and inviting and just, it will all encompass you and stuff. So yeah, Forky is actually, he was an amusing character, but uh, I also have to give mad props to uh, the Key and Peele characters of Ducky and uh, the Rabbit or whatever. They're carnival toys that are like sewn together and they're, they're hilarious, they're endearing, they induce some of the 
I guess closest laughs to something like humorously scary in their dream sequences when they're trying to suggest a plot to get this key that they need to get out of this antique store where the most of the film takes place once it gets going and gets away from you know Bonnie's house and they go on this this little trip there's a theme park and the theme slash amusement park place is adjacent to this antique store which is where we encounter our villain that I will get to here in a little bit but yeah so I, I mean Key and Peele talking about just attacking this old woman, trying to get the keys from her. Basically, the toys blowing their cover. Hilarious. And the fact that it's just riff after riff of the same idea one after another. Some of the best laughs in the entire film, as is another dream sequence we get in kind of a little post-credits aspect of them seeking their revenge against the, the carny guy who had them just pinned up on the wall, no child to call their own and stuff. So they were great as well. So yeah, I guess the, the new toys really, really do shine because legitimately, um, with the exception of a returning Bo Peep and her, um, what, Billy, Goat, and Gruff, which I'm hilarious even though they're, they're sheep, they're not goats, but uh, in any event, yeah, the, the, the stuff with Bo Peep is great, and uh, everyone knows that we get some Keanu Reeves in here as this, like, Canadian, uh, I, I guess, uh, evil Knievel of sorts. He's great, too, once we get him in, and so it really, it does boil down to, we get some buzz, you know, but it, it really turns into Tom Hanks voicing Woody's story, and he's great in this, maybe as great as we've seen him in all honesty, because he he's so past that point of jealousy. We see some tinges of it initially in the story, but they go places with this story that I did not expect. And as great as all of those new toys that I mentioned are, it, it really boils down to this one that's a villain and the very interesting and sympathetic perspective that she has. So she she's in the antique store and she's this old doll from like the 50s and she has a voice box thing, you know, with a string attached, just like Woody, but hers has been defective or broken or whatever. And so, yeah, she has been undesirable, presumably, to any little girl to take her home because of that. And so that's where the crux of the villainy comes into play because she's just like, wow, you have a voice box. That's just like mine. When were you made? So on and so forth. And just the way she starts like almost interrogating him and then kidnaps Woody when he goes into this antique store trying to track down Forky. Uh, well, actually, no, not trying to track down Forky. Uh, Forky gets in there at some particular point. Forky's with him. He sees who he thinks is Bo Peep in there. And so it just all kind of spirals from there and him getting mixed up with this doll and her little minion army of ventriloquist dummies, which are legit like like Night of the Living Dummy slappy, creepy, and they don't really talk, which is especially funny, and yet uh, just the lighting of the antique store and the darkness of it at times, like, I could see this kind of creeping up, a little kid at least, you know? And so, it's just, um, it's an interesting take in the way that they proceed with the villainy without me actually, you know, uh, spelling things out directly. So, I found so much more merit to this story uh, much more so even of acceptance in moving on and just finding a new chapter in your life than I even got out of the third one. I felt like this was probably even more for adults at, at times than even the third Toy Story was, which is really saying a lot, but I mean, it's it's a really, really great film, and I mean, for, for adults, it's gotten, you know, as, as Pixar is always, always good for, you know, they always bring just terrific humor that I feel like is transcendental, you know, between really young kids all the way up to their, their parents and everyone in between. So, uh, as far as Malo goes, as far as bad goes, I mean, not all of the humor hits, and um, it is it is kind of disappointing to see so many of the OG toys that we love so much really having nothing to do aside from, you know, trying to just throw a monkey wrench in the plans of uh, Bonnie's father as he's trying to leave the amusement park and they they just become, they, they have some scenes where they're trying to stall the process of departure and that's really all that they get to do. They're a part of the process, but they really legitimately, all of our OG toys, Mr. Potato Head, you know, Slink Dog, all those, they all play second fiddle big, big time and I, I mean, Bo Peep wasn't introduced to what, three, I want to say anyway, you know? So it, um, yeah, that was the only thing that kind of got me in a little bit of a sad, disappointed type of state was just coming to accept that and just realizing, you know, they're happy, they're content, they don't have as much to do. It's Woody who has been, you know, kind of passed over and is in the tough spot. Um, 
Yeah, that's, that is really legitimately the only Malo that I can think of here because, you know, just segueing back to a little more good, the animation is as beautiful as it's ever been. Uh, you know, the humor is top-notch, the new toys are good, so there really is not an abundance of Malo to mention here. It's very, very minuscule. And so I guess now I will jump into Fail. I will jump into The Ugly because The Ugly pertains to spoilers with this film. And it's so... Woody is really placed with a interesting choice in the third act of this film, and it's where we see our villain in a different light, you know, because even though she's been, you know, kind of self-centered and stuff, there is, she just wants to be loved by a child more than anything else, and you really do feel for her. And so it comes to a point where, you know, Woody has been going around with Bo Peep and some of these other lost toys, and uh, Bo Peep has basically been telling Woody that being a lost toy has been the most invigorating, enlightening, and freeing experience, you know, of her existence as a toy. And while you can tell that she's still nostalgic for Andy's little sister and everything, that's who I think Bo Peep uh, was the toy of, if I remember, you know, uh, I think the third movie. You know, it's been a while since I've watched the second and the third Toy Story. But, that, I mean, yeah, it really, it... Woody still, you know, has a thing for Bo Peep, as you can imagine, and he still has the heart of gold where he's had that experience of a toy having loved him with the case of Andy. And this is where he comes to this really tough crossroads where essentially this villainous doll is not so villainous after all. She just wants to be loved and has never had the chance that Woody has already experienced and unfortunately hasn't experienced with Bonnie, you know? And so for the greater good, Woody decides to, you know, give up his voice box and, you know, they take it out and the ventriloquist dummies sew him up and everything. And so he gives up the one thing that would have possibly endeared him to a new child and stuff. And there are some very funny relational parallels that are gone into by some of the other toys. They're like, yeah, you just never got over it. You know, never got over that first relationship. You're still carrying a torch for, for that person and blah, blah, blah. So it's just... Someone who's experienced my fair share of heartache, it's, uh, it's really um, it's interesting the way that they approach that. But, I mean, the sacrifice, the selfless sacrifice that Woody makes and the different path that he decides to take, you know, I, it's really admirable. It genuinely, genuinely is. And it's that choice that Woody made that genuinely got me in the feels more so than the end of Toy Story 3. It was that beat with him just sacrificing an, an essence of himself and his own happiness for somebody else to experience it that never has before. And it shows the kind of valor that you'd expect from a sheriff. And he ends up passing, passing his badge along and deciding to just ride off into the proverbial sunset with Bo Peep. And it's, it's cute and the, the hug at the end, man, with him and Buzz when they're not gonna be together anymore, I teared up, dude. Yeah, I did. I'm like just thinking about it right now. I'm getting like a little bit of emotions. So yeah, man. Um, this it's it's got enough fun and slapsticky silly for kids, but boy, just like with part three, does this have a hefty dose to swallow for any adult, especially that is nostalgic about childhood, understands the sacrifices we make for others, whether it's you know our own children or friends or for career or or happiness in general. It's it was a really, really profound choice in the film that I was not expecting. And it's what pushed it over the threshold of part three as my second favorite, if not if not on par with the first Toy Story, genuinely for me at least. So I'm gonna give this four out of five Fuego Fireballs. That's right, this is a certified Fuego film. And I urge all of you, if you have not taken the chance to go see it, I'm sad that it took me so long to actually get around to checking it out because, you know, uh, of the three doll movies that are in theaters currently, this is absolutely by far 100% my favorite. So, I have been Jaime in Fuego. You can find moi on all social media sectors like Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, here on YouTube. So, if you get the chance, please, Portofa. Gracias. It would mean a great deal if you do the subscribe thing, do the like thing. I'm trying to get over a Jeezy in the subscribers so that I can get the live show going proper. Uh, and Fuego Tainment Live, the Nightly Nerd, Geek and Rewind, all that stuff that I've been talking about for quite some time at this point. Uh, but I always do at least a few videos every week. Uh, a Fresca Fuego review, which is a newer film. A retro Fuego review, usually. And then there's an interspersing of comics here and there, 
Um, the occasional novel thing, I've been doing Star Wars canon coverage for a while, that has been a lot of fun. I uh, just put up my Rogue One Revisited review, and I'm getting ready to start uh, the original trilogy proper, along with some Clone Wars stuff, uh, you know, some more of the Marvel comics and some of the in-canon novels, and I recently put up reviews for both yesterday, uh, I mean, goodness, all kinds of stuff so far this year, but uh, yes, it is a pleasure and an honor to have this film palaver with all of you, but if you want to see everything I do on the spectacular side of things, you always have youtube.com slash the horror show channel that is where we do at least one episode a day sometimes two and uh, everything from trailer reactions there to movie comic television book reviews uh, convention coverage we just got done doing mad monster recently which was a ton of fun uh, as always is and uh, yes uh, that's over 27 Thou's on strong, and we appreciate all of the support over there, too. So I guess that's going to be the end of the proceedings, at least for today. So I shall do my typical sign-off and say until the real of Ka comes around once more. Hasta luego, sin amigos, and constant viewers. But I am hopeful that we get to share some more of this film palaver sooner rather than later. Adios.